So, with zero intent to yuck someone else's yum, I am not a Prince fan. I am not a fan of the music, I am not a fan of the image, I am not a fan of the fandom that enabled both, and that is an opinion about which I have not been quiet for 25 years. Therefore, when I got back from Brazil, and my first words to the publisher were, I have something nice to say about Prince. Her first words to me were, what? I have something nice to say about Prince. That's what I thought you said. Salutations fellow readers, writers, and killers of time on YouTube. My name is Martha Jones, and many years ago in a land called Greece, there arose a myth about a guy named Pygmalion. He was not a hero by classical Greek standards, in that he fought no wars, and as far as we know, he died at a ripe old age. Instead, Pygmalion was an artist who specialized in sculpture, having long ago decided that women were rubbish. But amid his obsessive sculpting, and all of the not-sex he was having, he became lovesick for one of his statues. Over time, the sculptor grew pale and wan, and his lovesickness grew so severe that the goddess Aphrodite took pity on him and brought the statue to life. Whereafter, Pygmalion called to the ivory woman Galatea, married her, and raised with her a family of piglets. This story has been adapted many times, but the most comically significant versions I can think of without looking anything up were those from Between the Lions. Pygmalion? Yes. You, you're alive! Disney's Hercules the Animated Series. Hello? Her personality? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, just make her uh, crazy about me. Oh, okay, so beautiful and crazy about you. Good. Digging deep, huh? And the writings of a grumpy Irishman named George Bernard Shaw, whose play entitled Pygmalion was so successful it later got adapted into a musical of some renown called My Fair Lady. While the ancient Greek take on Pygmalion was entertaining, it was likely never viewed as an unambiguously happy story, in that the BCE Greeks thought one should avoid love at all cost because once a guy fell in love, he was useless. Then, after George Bernard Shaw took his crack at the myth, the perception of Pygmalion forever shifted from that of a pitiful figure in love with an unattainable ivory statue to that of an egotistical fool. Let's see, God makes man, then man acquires hubris and believes he's qualified to design and build the perfect woman? What could go wrong? I don't know, what's the highest score? Then, in 1990, an evil genius by the name of Gary Marshall directed a movie loosely based on My Fair Lady called Pretty Woman. In case you are unfamiliar with the plot of Pretty Woman, it is a quote love story unquote, in which boy meets girl, girl happens to be a prostitute, girl learns boy is afraid of heights. I'm afraid of heights. You are. Boy hires girl to pose as his girlfriend for the week, girl gets a new wardrobe, then hobnobs with snobs and endears herself to them through beauty and a charm, but mostly beauty. Slippery little suckers. Boy makes girl watch opera. Boy decides he wants to be happy and rich as opposed to merely rich, and tells his company of rich guys they are going to be slightly less evil from now on. Boy's friend and colleague, who quite liked being evil, thank you, assaults girl and boy punches friend in the head. Girl leaves boy. Boy buys flowers. Boy rides toward girl in his limousine from which he blasts tunes from the opera he made her watch. And boy conquers his fear of heights in order to kiss the girl right on the old fire escape. The end. For most of the movie-loving public, this version of the Pygmalion story has been common knowledge since 1990. But I first saw Pretty Woman early this year, and at the time, for the life of me, I could not tell you why it irritated me so very much. I think the second worst thing about this movie might be how badly it wants to be My Fair Lady, and sucks at it, though superficially, Pretty Woman has some things in common with its musical predecessor. The titles are synonyms of one another. The midpoint of both films feature an event centered around horses at which the protagonist does something embarrassing. Come on, Dover! Move your blooming arse! Both title characters get multiple makeovers, both dramatic works technically have a flower girl in them, and while neither My Fair Lady nor Pygmalion a la George Bernard Shaw contain a prostitute angle, Pygmalion, as told by Ovid, does. Because, having seen some enterprising young ladies from the Isle of Cyprus serving Aphrodite in a highly personal manner, Pygmalion, the mythical sculptor, supposedly began, quote, detesting the faults beyond all measure which nature has given to women, unquote which I presume is what led to his sculpting perfect women whose bodies he could more easily police. 
Nicely played, Mr. Million, if that is your real name. And I'll bet that all sounds a lot more romantic when your first language consists entirely of oinks. Unfortunately, Pretty Woman fails not only at being a worthy successor of My Fair Lady, but also in areas where it could have been its own thing. For instance, I struggle to believe that the folks who wrote and directed this sucker so much as saw a sex worker at a distance, let alone talk to one. Because in the context of the movie, we see evidence of sex workers getting brutalized not once, but twice. What do you know about that girl? I tell you, man, I don't know who she hanged with. Come on, guy, we just pulled her out of a dumpster in the back. It was a pimp. Okay. For the purpose of establishing that Vivian's line of work is a dangerous one, which, you know, it is, but also establishing that women like Vivian secretly want and need a man to save them from situations like this one? That is often not the case in real life. Like, I am by no means an expert in this field, but as a recovering jail nurse, I saw prostitutes come in one of two categories. Those who were beholden to the drugs first and the pimps second, or those who were tough and mean enough that they could keep the pimps away. So the fact that these ladies say they want to stay in business for themselves. Maybe we should get a pimp, you know, Carlos really digs you. And then he'll run our lives and take our money. No, you're right. We say who, we say when, we say how much. Then say a bunch of fragile sounding vulnerability nonsense to a John? You hurt me. That doesn't strike me as particularly genuine. To be clear, no woman should have to get calloused and mean just to survive. But I am on a first name basis with a prostitute who ran over a disrespectful man with her car. Another time, some man pulled a sweatshirt over her head with the intent of trying to kill her, and she whooped his ass. That is how tough and mean she had to be just to survive. And while I don't know if I could take care of myself as well as she did in that situation, I don't know that my survival instinct would permit me to give a John the satisfaction of letting him know he hurt me. Therefore, as presented by the movie, this hurt me. strikes me less as the way a survival-focused woman acts in this kind of situation and more like the way a certain kind of man would want a beautiful woman in need of rescuing to act. As far as more direct parallels to My Fair Lady, the dragging of this girl into Edward's world with zero effort to join her in hers is made extra gross by the way he repeatedly tells her with his actions how little she matters. For comparison, check out Henry Higgins. As self-centered and awful as Higgins often is in My Fair Lady, Eliza and he do bond over the solving of shared problems and through his, albeit briefly, treating Eliza as an equal. I know your headaches. I know you're tired. I know your nerves are as raw as meat in a butcher's window. Whereas in Pretty Woman, Edward delegates Vivian's entire training and makeover montage to the staff at his hotel, providing a wonderful opportunity for Vivian and Vincent to bond, while Edward jet sets or dick swings or counts money off screen somewhere. And you know what? We'll go ahead and call that like the seventh worst thing about this movie. Because the worst and most unforgivable part of Pretty Woman is this guy in his stupid limousine, white knighting to his own generic ass public domain opera music. See, despite being called Pretty Woman, this is not Vivian's movie. It is Edward's movie. Edward pays the fees, Edward calls the shots, Edward picks the venues. Edward makes all of the meaningful decisions because Edward is a wealthy man in the 90s, living out a white male power fantasy, and who, at the end of the day, can have anything he wants, including the girl he thinks he's carved from ivory. But dragging her to the opera when you already have this scene... I just want your extra time and your... Kiss. ...is, to phrase delicately, taking the piss. Would it have killed you to take your pretty woman to a Prince concert? Or to play that Prince song, the one you definitely know Vivian likes while you are selling forth to court her and retain her in your wealth mobile? Because the words are kind of perfect. You don't have to be rich to be my girl. But no, Vivian sings it to herself, and she never learns how incredible she is in the context of this film, or that she deserves better than Edward in every meaningful way. Don't you just love Prince? More than life itself. And if you think I'm being overly critical and harsh to Pretty Woman, you're probably right. And while at the end of the day it feels, to me, more like a rich dude is showing off than a lovable protagonist is getting a happy ending, Vivian does confide in us and Edward what would be her childhood dream come true. When I was a little girl, I would pretend I was a princess trapped in the tower by a wicked queen. And then suddenly, this knight on a white horse with these colors flying would come charging up and draw his sword and he would climb up the tower and rescue me. But how much stronger would the scene be if instead of... 
we got. As Miss Vivian would put it, Mr. Moby. You hurt me. So, to an extent, Pretty Woman is the myth. I repeat, myth of Pygmalion coming full circle. God creates man. Man exhibits hubris and believes he is qualified to design and build the perfect woman. And he gets rewarded for his hubris with an incredible mate. But if there are any Galateas of the world who are currently watching this, you, yes you, can raise your standards and require the Pygmalions of the world to meet them. Or better yet, hold out for a prince among men. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. If you are a fan of leaving hateful comments on videos that give feminist reads on classics, thank you in advance for your engagement. Consider giving this video a shot. Until we meet again, take it easy. Love you. Bye.